I can't hear anything. So I, yes. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> so yeah, welcome and thanks for having me um, for this session on what the crack coordinated restore checkpoint on the Java virtual machine. So as I was already introduced, my name is Gerrit Brunwald. I'm coming from Germany. I'm working for Azul Systems as a developer advocate. And um, if you would like to reach out, then you just can later on just take your camera and you will get my information from the QR code. So Java is great. There's no doubt about that, right? And we have a vibrant community. As we can see here, I'm currently in Stockholm, JFocus conference, and um, we have hundreds of jugs, and I have the pleasure to talk to one of those today. And we have thousands of free open source software projects and also tons of commercial software that is written in Java, but uh, the real star of the whole Java thing is the Java virtual machine. Right? This is really the, that's the base of all of that of all the success that we have, right? Java is more than 25 years old and it's still great. And it, it gets better and better every year. So, but how does the, the JVM really work? So, I mean, probably most of you know, but I will go just quickly to it because this is an important part. So we have some source code, which is a, some Java file and we put it into the compiler Java C and we get some class file out of it, which is in bytecode. And then what probably usually happens is we put, take the bytecode, have a class loader, then the class loader loads the bytecode into JVM memory. And once it is in the memory, then we have the so-called execution engine, which contains more than I have here, but we just focus on three things, which is uh, the interpreter and then the C1 JIT compiler and the C2 JIT compiler. So we have two JIT compilers in the execution engine and an interpreter. So let's see how that works with our class file. So first of all, we have the interpreter. So that takes the bytecode and converts that into the construction set of the current CPU. So that, I mean, the whole bytecode thing makes the, the Java code transportable between all these different operating systems, right? Because this is the base. And then on the system, you take the interpreter and it converts the, the bytecode into the instruction set of the current CPU and architecture that we have. And once this is running, the JVM detects hotspots by counting method calls, right? So it means uh, it really counts actually how often is a method called when it's interpreted. So that's also the reason why the hotspot compiler has its name. And once this method call counter reaches a specific threshold, the JVM will take that hotspot methods and then pass it further to the C1 JIT compiler. In former days, this was called the client compiler and it compiles code as fast as possible with uh, not a lot of optimization. So that means th the goal is to create compiled code as fast as possible to make it faster, right? So this is the C1 JIT compiler. And then again, during its, when it's running the compiled code, the JVM starts profiling this compiled code. And there are lots of hooks into this prof in this code that was created by C1. And the JVM just checks for hot code. That means again, it's profiling, is there something that is called, called very often? So, and if it detects that stuff and it reaches a specific threshold, then again, it takes this hot code and pass it to the C2. JIT compiler, which is the former known server compiler. This one creates highly optimized code and it's a beast. So it's it really, it's very complex. It's old, but it's good. But it takes a little bit of time to compile. It's, it's more complex, the compilation process than the C1, but the code that it produces, it's very fast. So that's in principle how this whole thing works. And that's great because with this, you can just during runtime, optimize your, the running code for the for your application. The problem with that with that is, it just takes some time, right? And if we take a look at the <clears throat> the JVM performance graph that we see here, we see the yellow part in the lower left corner, which is the interpreted part. Then we see the profiling part. This is the green part, and then you see over time the blue part. It's the optimizations that going on, and and at one point it reaches the optimum performance, right? This is one in this case. And that's usually what we name, this is the application warm-up or the JVM warm-up. So it, you can 
say, JVM warm-up, application warm-up. But this is probably the time that your application needs until all caches are filled up, everything's, every method was touched and all that kind of things. So, and then you see these this gaps there, right? These gaps are so-called de-optimization. This is the stuff you don't want to see. That is when the JVM compiler, for example, it, it does some speculative optimization. That means it checks the code, it finds some branches, and it just said, okay, this branch looks to me like this will be called very often. So I optimize just the branch. And it, it's good as long as it's running, but if at some point the other branch was called, then it has to put the whole thing back to the interpreter and recompile it. This is a de-optimization. <clears throat> so we try to avoid that if possible because this has performance hits, right? So then we go with that, with that knowledge, <clears throat> we go to the microservice environments that we have today. That means it's not only one monolith application that is running for a month, but usually you have lots of these things running just shortly. You spin it up, you throw it away, all that. That means first run, warm up, second run, warm up, third run, warm up, and so on and so on. So that means every time you start up the JVM, you have to wait until the application reaches its optimal performance before you really can benefit from the JITs and all that. So that's a little bit disappointing because you, you would like to just pull up all these services quickly and they should be there. And then after that, you just would like to throw it away and, and all that kind of things. So JVM startup time could be a problem. So wouldn't it be great if you can do something like this? So first run, you have to warm it up. Second run, it's already starting from the warmed up state. Third run, again and again and again. So the, the, re, the idea is to just have the startup time just once. And then every time you start it up after that, it's just fast. It's just optimized. So that, that's the idea. It would be great. So, okay, we can say, why not use ahead of time compilation? This is not an, a new thing. It's just a static compilation that we also see in C, right? You take the code, you compile it, and then it's done. So there's no interpretation of bytecodes. There's no analysis of hotspots. So no runtime compilation of code. It starts directly at full speed straight away. And uh, GraalVM, native image, does that, right? So problem solved, right? Mm, not so fast because there are also have, it has some drawbacks. So the head of time compilation is by definition static. So that means the code is compiled before it's run. So remember the JVM just compiles and optimizes the code when it's running with the head of time compilation. The compiler has no idea what the code is actually doing. It just compiles it, right? And there is a way to optimize that because you can profile the running code and then you can take this so-called profile guided optimization. You can take the profile, you save it, and then you apply it to the compiled code. That gives you some kind of a benefit. So it, at least for the time you did the profiling, you get this, this optimizations you get. But after that, if at runtime something happens and you would like to react on that, no chance because this is then done, right? So this is the, the thing. So if we compare ahead of time versus JIT compilation, then the head of time compilation, you have, for example, a class loading prevents method inlining because once the stuff is loaded, there is no optimization or some method inlining, which is used on the JIT. It does massive, aggressive met method inlining, which is, I don't want to go into that now, but it, it's really something like you can imagine you have an object that has maybe some properties and it has getters. And instead of calling the getters to get the, the value, the method inlining directly calls in the value. It just calls dot the value, even if it's private. So because this is all encapsulated internally in the JVM, the JVM is able to do that. And with the head of time compilation, you can't do, right? So you can't do this method inlining. There is no runtime bytecode generation where the JVM or the JIT can do that. Uh, reflection is kind of hard when doing AOT, where in JIT, I mean, Reflection is no, it's never easy, but it's possible and easier than with the AOT, where they have some problems. They make it work, but still, I think in Graal, I, you can't use everything right now with, related to reflection. <clears throat> you can't use the speculative optimizations. That's the stuff that I mentioned, where you have, for example, 
where the JVM or the JIT just defines, oh, this branch looks good. I optimize this part of the, of the code and make it faster. So with the AOT, you can't do that, right? It, it, optim it just compiles the code, that's it. There's no optimizations. That leads to the fact that the overall performance with AOT is typically a bit lower than where it is with the JIT, typically a bit higher and more flexible. Well, apart from that, with AOT, you have full speed from startup, right? Because it's compiled, it's there, it just works. Where the JIT needs warm up time. The same goes for the CPU overhead, because if you have the, you can imagine if you have all this compilation, interpretation, optimization going on in the, the warm up time, this draws a lot of CPU. So that means the CPU that is used for the compilation is not available for your application. You don't have that with AOT, but you have that with the JIT. So this is the drawback of the JIT and the advantage of the AOT. Well, if we take a look at, again at the JVM performance graph and you now say, let's take a look at ahead of time compilation that will bring us to that level of performance. Yeah. No really long startup time, it's just instantly there, but the performance is not quite good. So let's say we do the profile guided optimization that gives us the possibility to profile the code and then apply that to the ahead of time compiled compile code it will give us around 80% of the performance that the JIT can produce, right? So it's it's good, but it's still not on the same level that the JIT has, right? This is just, this is not the head of time compilation with the profile guided optimization. This is just guessing here. So, but it's, we have some tests that, that prove that it's around this area. Well, so what about a different approach then? There is a project in the Linux world, it's called Creo, which is checkpoint restore in user space. So what it is, is it's a Linux project. It's in part of the kernel, kernel since I think 3.11, quite some time it's already there. The idea was to freeze a running container or application. And then, so it's, it's really probably, it's checkpointing the stuff. So it means like, okay, save it here, stop it and save it to the disk, the whole thing, the container or the application. And then at some point you can just restore it from there back into memory and it's up and running again. So this is the idea and it's uh, it's already used. I mean, it's used by OpenVZ, it's open by, by Linux containers, Docker is using it, Podman is using it. So this is uh, this is nothing which is experimental. It's, it's in production, right? Trio is used uh, in the world. So the idea is, can we make use of it? Well, so there, there are some challenges if you take a look at Trio. It's what about open files? You, you have the, your applications running, you have some files open, you have some shared memory. This is not easy to save that, right? So the whole thing, what, what happens to the open files, right? This is the hard part. Then there's, you can imagine on Linux, each application that is running has a PID. That means this, this, this one unique ID so you can't just restore that multiple times because the ID is just unique. So this is a problem. And then if you think about the JVM as an application, it's not so easy to just say to the, to the JVM, okay, save it, restore it. Because the JVM assumes that it's the only thing that's running and it, it has some dependency. So you have to somehow make the JVM aware that it will be saved. Right and make it aware that it will be restored from a safe state. So these are the challenges using Creo, and there is this project called Crack, which is coordinated restore at checkpoint. And the coordinated, this is the interesting part here, because what it does. So Creo, the the, the project from Linux, it comes bundled with the JDK, and what it does or what it uh, offers to the JVM is the heap is cleaned. And the JVM is compatible. That means the JVM is in a safe state when it when it gets checkpointed, right? So, and then there's also something like a checkpoint exception. That means if you create a checkpoint and you run it, it's not that it goes to the black hole and will never come back, but it will give you an exception that say, okay, there was a checkpoint exception when you tried to save the state because there have been some open files or there have been a web connection which was not closed, something like that. And it, it, it comes with a simple API. And you can either create the checkpoint by code, 
or you can use a J command to create a checkpoint. It depends. So both is possible. And you will find the project on uh, this uh, URL. So openjdk.java.net slash projects slash crack. And it's led by one of our engineers. With, his name is Anton Kozlov. And he's leading this project. And we started that. I'm not sure exactly when we started, but it became part of the OpenJDK projects um, in the beginning of our end of last year. So now it's an official OpenJDK project, and we hope it will make it into the, the official distribution of OpenJDK. Um, so, but back to the coordinated restore at checkpoint. Crack has some more restrictions than Creo has because there shouldn't be open files, there shouldn't be open sockets or any connections or database connections, something like that. So to make sure that the JVM has the chance to react on the checkpointing itself, there is this, um, there are methods that will be provided by Crack for the JVM and though with, for your application that you can react on that. When that means if Crack says, here's a checkpoint, it will call a method and you can in that method close all the resources and then it will be saved to this to the disk and when it was, will be restarted you will again have a method that will be called again and then you can restore all the the resources that you use like restoring connections or whatever database connections things like that so there is this api that i mentioned already it's called the crack api and it's pretty simple. It's just one interface. It's called resource. And it just has two methods like before checkpoint and after restore. That's the two methods that I mentioned. And what you have to do, if you, for example, have methods that like a database manager or whatever, uh, usually this is the class that implements the resource interface. So that means it will be called before the checkpoint will be uh, saved to state and after it was restored. So in this class, then you can react and close the database connection and restore it. And there's also, it received these callbacks during the checkpoint and restore. That's what I said, right? And um, that makes it possible to close, restore resources or open files or whatever. So the idea is that if you have these classes that implements the resource, so your resource objects, you need to register them in Crack. And there is a, you need a context to do that. There is a global context in Crack that you can get by core.get global context. And then you can just register your resources to that context. So the, the idea is it looks like this. So you have, a, you have your class, it implements a resource interface. You get the global context and you register your class to that context. That, that's the idea. And then the global context mint, maintains a list of all the resources that you have because you can have multiple, right? So it's not just one. And then, it also takes care that they will be called uh, or stored in the, in the order they have been added. So that means you can define which resources should be added at what point. And then also when it will be restored again, it will make sure that they will be called in the reverse order. So to make sure that you really can, if you have, for example, resources that depend on others, you can make sure with this that they are always will be called in the right order. And um, like I said already, you can do that programmatically, like core.checkpointRestore. This one, this method will just create the checkpoint for you. And it leads to the fact that, because my idea was the first time I heard it, it was like, oh, that's cool, because I could just create a checkpoint and the application continues to work. No, that's unfortunately not the case. So it will stop running. This is really made to save everything, close everything, stop it. So that it's like system exit, right? So the, the application will stop and it will store the, the checkpoint. That's what this method does. And the same can be done by just using the J command. If you, you can, from the outside, you can stop the, the JVM. So it's also possible. So I have a simple example for that. And what I did was I just, I thought about how can I visualize or make clear the effect of all that because we have some demos i will come to that later but this is just a simple example so what i do i have a thread that every five seconds this thread calls a loop and in this loop this loop goes one hundred thousand times and it checks random numbers within this one hundred thousand uh, and check is the number a prime number 
And every time it does it, it checks first, is this number in the cache? If it's in the cache, it directly returns it and says, yep, it's here. And this is quite fast because it's just asking memory, right? So this no calculation is going on. If it's not in the cache, it has to calculate, is it prime? And then the result will be stored in the cache. And after that, it will be returned. So this is slower, of course. And then to make it a little bit more realistic, the cache forgets all the values that it has stored every 60 seconds. So that means if I store a value now and it wasn't recalled within the next 60 seconds, the cache will forget about it. So that's the main idea of the code. And so that means the first run will be quite slow because the cache is empty. That means every call has to be checked. Is it prime? Yes, no, then put it in the cache and then return the value. And then um, it will decrease. This time will decrease with every run because the cache will fill up, right? So that, that leads to the fact that it should simulate the application warm up time that I mentioned in the beginning. So, and I did some, some measurements and this is how it looks like. So that means the first, it's really slow. And then the longer it runs, the iterations, so it will be faster and faster, and then it will level around one. So this is the, the optimum performance that we can reach. So the demo, and I will do a demo like this. So I will show you the demo here, right? So this is just two terminal windows. And when I finish the presentation, I will show you the actual demo. So I will really run it. So, but this is to explain it, it's easier to show it here. So what I will do is I created this program and there's also a link to the source of that. So you can play around with it on your own and this will come later on. So what I do is I create a jar file, which is just an executable jar. It's called crack4.jar. And I call it with this specific parameters like dash xx, colon and then crack checkpoint two equals. And then I give it the folder where it should store the checkpoint. That means this is a folder where it will store all this, the state of the JVM, right? And then I call minus jar and then start the jar. So what will happen is the first run will take long. And th this number is coming from this machine where I run Linux on a Mac in a JVM, in a virtual machine, that means it's quite slow. If I run it on my M1 Mac, then the whole thing just takes 1.3 seconds. So it's really fast. So for this demo, this was around 30 seconds, the first run. So, and then you see the second run, which is always every five seconds, it calls this loop. It's just 10 seconds because the cache is already 68,000 elements in the cache. So the third run, it's 95,000. So it gets faster and faster. You see with every call, it gets faster. So then at one point when it's fast enough, I just say, okay, now it's fast. It's 14 milliseconds. It's nearly completely filled the cache. Then on the second window, the second terminal window, I just create the checkpoint by calling J command. And I just call the jar file. Right and say JDK dot checkpoint, and that will save that will save then the files to the to the folder that I uh, give it in the in the first call, and you see it will give you the PID. So on the right terminal window it says I stopped the PID twenty thousand seven hundred nineteen, and you see on the left side this is the PID of the of the application, and then you can see because I put it in the code it prints out before checkpoint is called in the main class. And before a checkpoint is called in the generic cache, this is the cache class. So I have two resources registered to the context. And then it just creates the checkpoint and it kills the application. So that's it. So it just stopped. And now we can wait, right? And at some point, and this is then the application warm up time, right? Because I, I measured it and said, now, now it's fast. Let's create the checkpoint here. And then at one point, I can just restore it. And so what I do is I just call Java minus xx colon crack restore from and i just pointed to the folder where we have the stored files and what happens then is that first of all it, it calls the resources and it's you see it's in the reverse order so it first calls the generic cache and then it calls the main <clears throat> and you see uh, the, the counter in the in the beginning it's now the eighth time it calls it and it just takes 90 milliseconds and the cache is nearly the same right it's filled so that means if I restore it from the checkpointed files, it's just fast. It's 19 milliseconds where it took the first time I ran it, it took 
nearly 30 minutes, uh, 30 seconds to start up. So that's a huge improvement, right? Because we save the complete warm up time, because this is stored, the, the optimized warmed up JVM state is stored in the, in the checkpoint, and we just restore it from there. So the time that we see here is really just the time it takes to load the stuff in, back into memory and start it. That's all. And that's really impressive. And then you see, and I do more runs, it stays around that, right? It's still, oh, yeah, it's still filled. So and continues like that. And the good thing here is that now it's still using the JITs. So that means if now the application runs into a state that we didn't profile before or didn't have in the warm up, it can optimize it because it's just the, the JVM running with all its JIT capabilities. So that means you benefit, you have a really quick startup time and still have the beneficial, beneficial uh, optimizations that can come from the JIT compilation. So like I said, you can checkpoint it from the command line using the J command just by this, that, that's all you need to create the checkpoint or you can do that by code, right? Like core checkpoint restore, the same thing, same thing will happen. So for example, you can think about if you have some metric that can give you the, the application performance, right? The performance of your application at that time, you can measure that. And then you see, oh, now it's really fast. So it's optimized. And then you can create it by, by for example, by code. Then you don't have to wait um, uh, let's say for 10 minutes or for an hour, because you can just do it in code, have some metrics going on and that measures the performance of your application. And if you determine, okay, now it's fast enough, then you can create the checkpoint. And the idea behind it is just think about, you warm up your application, you create the checkpoint, then from this checkpointed JVM, you create a Docker image, right? And suddenly you can start up as many Docker images as you would like, because it will always load it directly from the store checkpoint. And because it's capsulated in the Docker container, it's no problem that we have it, that all of them have the same pit, but it's in different uh, Docker containers. So that, that's not a problem at all, right? So that's the main idea. If you have the microservices, you can just spin up containers like this, no problem. And it's fast. So the, the demo code that I, showed you here, it's uh, on my GitHub repository. So you find it at github.com slash hansolo slash track four. Um, so you can play around with that. And we, we I will show you the demo uh, after the presentation so that you can see it really running. Um, okay, so that, that was the simple demo, okay? So, but how good is it really? So we made some tests and for example, we have a Spring Boot application and we measured the time to first operation. And with the Spring Boot, it took around, let's say, four seconds. If we used with Crack, it was 38 milliseconds, which is really fast. Micronaut was about one second. And with using Crack, it was 46 milliseconds. Quarkus, 980 milliseconds, and then 33. And then we did some XML transformation, which was around four or three seconds, down to 53. You see that it doesn't really matter how long the original startup time was, because once you have the optimized JVM, the warmed up, and this is just loading from, from the disk into memory. So that's the, that, that's the reason why the, the time's nearly always the same. It's just loading the stuff into memory and run it. Right? It doesn't matter how long the startup time was. And here we have some, uh, we also did some, a comparison between the OpenJDK and the OpenJDK on crack, where we just say the, the uh, we see the requests on the on the x-axis and we see the seconds on the y-axis. And you see that with the OpenJDK, it took some time until the JVM reached the its optimal performance, where we are using crack, it was already warmed up. It's just linear, it's just there's no impact with the related to the time, right? Because it's just we we are starting from a already optimized JVM. And for Spring Boot, this was like that. And we did that also for Quarkus. It, it was a little bit bigger gap, but okay, this is just to, to show you that you really can do, you really have a linear uh, increase. So it's not really related to the, to the time, to the startup time of the, of the application anymore. So as a summary for that, is that the crack idea is it's a way to pause a JVM-based application, 
Right? And it doesn't matter what it is, it's just the JVM. So it could be, you can write it on whatever runs on the JVM, it's, it, it's, it will work. And you can restore it at some point in the future. Right? It doesn't matter when, but there is a drawback to that. I will come to that in the demo. And the benefit is potentially ex extremely fast time to full performance, because you can imagine there's nothing, there's nothing you have to do, right? It's already there. You just load it into memory and it's there. Uh, so it eliminates the need for hotspot identification. You don't have to compile methods, recompile, de-optimizations. De-optimizations can happen still, of course. It, it always depends on the how long did you wait before you took the checkpoint, right? So then this is the, the, the magic time and only you know how long the application needs to warm up really. And of course, the improved throughput from the start is, is much higher throughput. And it's an open JDK project. You can even participate if you like. So it's nothing secret. You will find it on, uh, on GitHub. It's github.com slash crack. This is there you can find all the source code. And there you will also find the demos, the, the um, Spring Boot demo, the Micronaut demo, and the Quarkus demo. It's, it's all on there. So if you would try it on your own, feel free to do so. Just keep in mind that the OpenJDK version, which you can also download from there. So it's there's a specific OpenJDK version at the moment. It's 17.02 um, that comes with Crack, and it's only for Linux x64. So you can only run it there. So there's no other way to run it at the moment. There's also there there are people are working on um, on the idea to also port that to Windows and to Mac, but because the Creo thing. The, the library, the, this project for you is not really part of macOS and it's also not available on Windows. So they have to find alternatives to, to make it happen. So right, I know that people, we are looking into that, but it's not at the moment, it's, it's not there. It's just for Linux, just for x64. Uh, there's also a wiki. It's wiki.openjdk.java.net slash display slash crack. And you will find further information about the project there. There's also the links to download the, the OpenJDK version. And um, that's, the, that's the slides. And now let's see if we can get to the demo because therefore I have to go here, okay. Okay, here we go. So what I did, this is exactly the stuff that I showed you before in the, in the slides, but now we run it really on the machine. And um, so I have a, instead of typing in the Java minus XX colon crack from um, checkpoint two and so on, I just put it in a, in a shell script because this is not really that fancy. And you see on the left side, I will start the, the application and on the right side, I will checkpoint it, right? So let's see, I start it and okay. You can see it takes some time around 30 seconds, like I said, and then we will wait maybe 15 runs and you, you can see how the time will change. It will, first of all, it will get faster. And then at one point, I think it's around 12 or 13, it, it gets a little bit slower and then it, it comes to some equilibrium, right? So it's in the, in the balance then, and then we will do the checkpoint. So yeah, you see, that was the first run, 28 seconds, 63,000 elements in the cache. So the cache is around 63% filled. And the next one will be faster. Ah, you see it's 10 seconds. And so see the cache is filling up and oh, now it's faster. And now we see it, it stops a little bit. Now we have the five second interval. We will just wait a little bit because you will see it will, it will get a little bit slower again here. And then now it will go down to 40. I think this is something 87 milliseconds, but you see it's now it's fast. It's more or less warmed up, right? So that means I can now create the checkpoint. I will do it on the right side and create the checkpoint. You see, you see the pit on the right here, 14,430. And this was the, the pit of the process, right? So this is, and this is also the reason why you can't simply just start it multiple times on this machine because there's only one pit for each process. So that doesn't work. So now the interesting part is, and I didn't tell you in the slides, I told you that the cache will forget after 60 seconds, it will forget the values, right? So now you see, I stopped the JVM and now I will restore it. 
And maybe that have been, I don't know, we can talk a little bit longer, but it will probably be some, most of the values will be older than 60 seconds, right? Because when I started up now, you would assume, okay, first time I call the cache, everything in the cache would say, oh, this is outdated and wipe it out. So then the cache is empty and we start again with 28 seconds and so on. So the trick is that before I create the checkpoint, I just store the time as the, the current um, epoch, the epoch seconds, right? The milliseconds, I store them in the variable and that variable will get checkpointed. When I restore it, I just take, give me the value that, that I stored when I saved the checkpoint and I take the actual, the, the actual epoch milliseconds and the, the delta I just add to all values in the cache. And so I make sure that even after an hour, the values in the cache won't be outdated. So that means if I now restore it, so I just say restore, you will see it's directly 51 milliseconds. So it, and the cache is still filled. So it's fast. There, is, there was no overhead at all. And this is, and the interesting part is that was my little demo project. And it doesn't matter if you run a Spring Boot project, right? So it, of course, the more, the bigger the JVM the application was, the more files you save, it takes a bit longer. But if you load something from an SSD into memory, this is always fast. So we can we can take a look at the stored files. Let, let's take a look. Um, here we go. This is that that is was stored. That's the the JVM that was stored. So you see, the biggest file is this one, and. Yeah, the rest is just small files, but this is this is bigger. What is it? Yeah, it's a it's 30 max, something like that. And of course, it will get bigger the larger the application is, of course. But um, from that, and the good thing is now, oh, we can restart again, right? So just take a look at it. Was we restart at number 16 here? So it will restart at the 16th call. It should restart at the same thing. If I restore it. You see, again, 16, again, 55, 54 milliseconds. So you can restart as often as you like because it will just load the stuff back into memory. And this is exactly the effect. So if I would now create the Docker image with the stored files in a folder and would just start it with the restoring, then it's just fast, it's just there. And it doesn't matter what you use if you have a big application or like this, a small one, right? So this is. That's the main idea behind Crack. And I think it's it's really fascinating what you can do with that because, um, and I'm wondering that nobody really did that before. It, it, it's not that hard, right? So we just have one interface. Of course, you have to implement it in all these classes that you, that you use to, to uh, have resources in there. But once you do that, it's you can really have the, the good side of both worlds. You have this, the fast startup and you have the JIT compilation. So that's that's the main idea behind Crack. And um, and because it's so simple, I'm already done with my presentation. So, <laughs> so if uh, we, we have a lot of time to discuss or, or for questions, if you like. So no, um, this, is, this is really all I got. So it, I, I didn't thought that it was so quick. 